Hello, everyone, and welcome back to day six of Bitwise, where we build a complete software hardware uh, stack from scratch for a simple computer. Uh, where we left off uh, day five, uh, we mostly went through the, uh, the ion parser and AST code, uh, sort of just uh, going through it somewhat randomly, covering different points that I thought would, would be interesting or, or perhaps confusing to people who haven't seen that kind of code before. Um, but we didn't write any code on stream. Uh, for that day. Uh, today I'm planning to do more more live coding. Um, I actually, before we do jump into that, I will do a quick diff review from, from stuff that was checked in since last time. Fortunately, it's mostly small stuff. Uh, and I will just look at the, the commit list to see if anything stands out as very interesting. Most of it was just bug fixes. Let's see here. Um, so maybe as a follow-up to the, the the tiny bit of live coding I did on the stream to implement the size of uh, expressions, I, I want to show you how I fixed, uh, how I improved uh, the design afterwards. So if you recall, I ended I ended up adding a single size of expression kind, and then uh, the auxiliary data for size of uh, had two kinds, subkinds, uh, and then you know like this. And I realized afterwards that even though syntactically that's kind of how you'd think about it. Uh, semantically, even though they're syntactically similar, there's no reason to have that kind of nested hierarchy. So I just moved those kinds up to the top level, and now there's a separate size of expression and size of type kind. Uh, and the auxiliary data just got moved into um, these data fields in the expression type itself. So just as a tiny follow-up uh, from that, uh, and, you, and you can see we just changed this to have two separate cases. So uh, that I, clearly the better approach, but uh, just wanted to close the loop on that. Uh, other than that, I think uh, it was just sort of parser bugs and other minor bugs and improvements. Um, this one is maybe interesting to talk about. So you'll recall when we started the parser, um, well, rather than just looking at the diff, I'll bring up the source file so you can see stuff more linearly. Um, you'll recall that one trick we used to kind of get started on the parser, or at the lexer rather, was uh, the idea of eponymous, uh, eponymous token kinds where s s single character tokens um, had, to, had their own value as an ASCII character uh, as a token kind. And that trick is certainly convenient for, um, you know, it's, it, it kind of cuts down on a bunch of boilerplate when you can use it. But um, we, we got to a point where um, I ended up having to move so so many single character tokens into a specified uh, explicit token kind um, for reasons I'll talk about in a sec. And once that started, I just decided to move all of them over there. So right now, I don't think we have any, at least intentionally, like I guess error tokens, let me see how I handle the default case now. Yeah, so you can see right now, we used to have just a, a generic thing that would create an eponymous token kind. Um, for this default case, and now it's actually treated as, you know, hey, this isn't a syntax error, and we just skip it. Um, so, th so that's kind of a, a big change, and, and the major reason for it is uh, it cleaned up a couple of things, even though it requires more code. Um, but the big one is that um, I mentioned in passing when we were talking about the operator uh, president's parser that there's some needlessly slow and verbose stuff where the thing I was doing up here in set is unary operator. I was basically doing for all the different president's levels. Uh, and for some of them, it was a big, long uh, disjunction. Um, and what I, I think what I mentioned there is we can actually remove all that code by just consolidating the token kinds into consecutive ranges corresponding to fixed president's levels. Um, and so that's what I ended up doing. But it meant that for to single character tokens like mul, div, mod, and and, um, we had to make them explicit token kind so we can permute them in the in the right order in the in the enum. And so that's what I did. So I just consolidated them uh, into these consecutive ranges and then I created these uh, helper values to signify the um, the beginning and end. Actually, I guess th th this is actually not the right way of writing it. Um, or, I mean, it works, but it should be token first mall. Um, I'm not going to change it for all of them right now because then I have to retest and I might break some stuff. But um, anyway, yeah, so you consolidate these into consecutive ranges and then you can do a single range, uh, numeric range check to see if some given token actually falls in a given president's range. So that's a convenient simplification for that. Uh, and I, 
I do something similar um, for the assignment operators. So all the assignment operators, uh, which are matched in, um, in parse simple statement, uh, you can see this is now this is now done with a range check rather than a bunch of individual equality checks. So it cuts down on the amount of code, also speeds things up a bit. Uh, definitely worth doing. This is one of the nice things. You know, you have these degrees of freedom in the enums because uh, for the most part, all you care about is that they are distinct values of a certain type. Um, but, not, but for cases like this, you can consolidate them into certain classes that can easily be checked with interval checks. So that's the motivation behind that. Uh, and, and that also meant that I needed to match things more explicitly uh, rather than just relying on the default case. And so I added a case one that just does that. And so now all that sort of boilerplate just looks like this. So you can see this corresponds to the old stuff that was just handled in the default handler. Uh, and now rather than, even for these cases, if you want to match a solitary colon, it, it doesn't, you know, you have to specify the explicit uh, token kind to go along with it. Whereas before this was, this was written like this before. Uh, and it was implicit that if only this thing matched, it would use the eponymous token kind as the tag, but now it's explicit. So th that was one follow-up item. Um, and uh, what else? Here's something I added um, that is maybe interesting. Um, generally useful as well. We're not using it very heavily right now, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool trick and it's worth putting in your, in your tool bag if you're uh, sort of accumulating tricks from, from Bitwise. Um, so I added a function called, uh, well, it's a, it's a macro um, called buff sprint f. Uh, but really most of the work is being done in, in this function. And really what it is, is it's treating uh, a character buffer as a, it's treating a character buffer as an append only string buffer. So, you know, just like when you're doing printf to uh, a file, you know, you're, you're using printf or fprintf, uh, it will actually, you know, it will concatenate to the file uh, from, from, from the cursor's position onward. Uh, and so this is a very useful thing, and you could tell that we were already using it um, for printing to standard out in our uh, in our print code. So you can see how this kind of print code you can very con conveniently have this imperative recursive style where you're just writing a bunch of sequential statements. And the semantics, of course, with printf is that they just concatenate their uh, respective outputs. And so by using sequ sequential uh, composition, this just ends up concatenating all those outputs, uh, which is a very convenient thing to do in an imperative language. Um, but what if you want to do the equivalent of this, but you don't want to print directly to a file or directly to standard out, but you want to accumulate it into a buffer. Uh, and that's what buff printf does for you. Um, so basically, I mean, you can read the code, but what it does is it uses SN printf to first discover uh, the length of the added chunk you want to add to the buffer, and then it makes sure there's room for it. And then it actually does a second uh, SN printf to actually write the data formatted to the buffer. There's one small gotcha here to deal with uh, zero termination because this does respect zero termination so that at every point, uh, this is not just a random st stretchy buff, but it's actually a zero terminated uh, C string as well. So you can use it as a C string with all the standard C APIs. And so that's why there's this special case for, uh, for buff len equals zero. It has to make room for the string terminator even if the string length is actually zero. Uh, and this destination offset thing is just to handle the fact that you want to, when you're concatenating to an existing string buffer with buff printf, you want to uh, clobber the existing null terminator because otherwise you end up just with essentially the buffers are concatenated, but as a C string, it's still only the first piece because it's the old null terminator is still there kind of interstitially. So um, that's basically the idea. And let me show you how it's used right now. Uh, so I was just showing you, and, and, th and this is probably not going to change. It's just a, a hack uh, for now. But right now I just have printf, so you think it's printing to uh, standard out? You're wrong. It's actually uh, redirecting conditionally to a buffer. So if you said use print buff, uh, it's actually going to redirect to uh, this this buffer, this accumulation buffer. Otherwise, it's going to redirect to standard out. And then there's a flush function where you can specify a file to to flush the buffer to, and it will reset the buffer. Uh, and this is also why I added a function called buff clear which just sets the length of the buffer to zero. So this, this essentially resets the buffer, but it doesn't free the buffer because there's no reason for this internal accumulation buffer to get reallocated and have to be regrown from scratch next time you have to do a bunch of, of printfs 
Um, so it just resets the length so it can be used new. Um, and so as a uh, as an example case of that, um, you go to the print. You can, I, I use it here just as a test case, but uh, even though this uses both printf manually and, and indirectly through these print expression functions, um, it actually internally ends up redirecting to the print buffer. And so you set print buff to true here, and um, and at the end I flush it to standard out so that ultimately we can see it on the screen, and then I set it back to false. And so if you run this. Uh, you can see it actually does go to standard out, uh, and it looks exactly the same. You know, if you um, if you put this to false, it's now not going to redirect, um, but it should still end up looking the same in the end. Um, as you can see, and also um, to make it even more explicit, if I set up, if I go to this line where we haven't yet flushed the buffer, there's nothing, and then we flush it. Oh, I should not do it that way. And then if we step, so there's nothing, and then we step over it, and now everything is printed. So again, the whole redef redef macro redefinition of printf is a giant hack um, I just used to, to make a point that, that will almost certainly change. But certainly, the idea of this kind of buff printf function that behaves like a stream is super powerful for any time you're uh, generating text output um, in a, in a code-driven way. Uh, compared to how you might do it in a functional language where you're constructing substrings and concatenating them, uh, here you're just kind of calling functions in order to do that same kind of task, and it's uh, it's efficient and it's very uh, very convenient and concise. So all right, I think that's roughly what I wanted to cover um, in terms of the review. So now to dive into the new thing we are going to do today. Uh, if people have questions about the printf stuff, for example, at the end of the stream, uh, make sure to tag me, and I'll happy to answer. But um, I, I would do I do want to move on to the next uh, to the next big task now that we've done the the parser, and that's to start work on order independent declarations. And so, uh, if you recall, I can't remember how much detail there was here in the original motivation doc. But one thing I decided early on, um, and all the motivation I think isn't written up here, but was mentioned in the live stream, but um, we end up wanting, uh, for various reasons, I mean, it's a very nice modern feature to have order independent declarations. And it doesn't conflict with our goal of, of emitting C code because it's very easy to reorder declarations and uh, synthesize for declarations uh, in order to uh, support, support that while still targeting kind of idiomatic C code on the output side. And so uh, I just decided this is something that I consider, you know, kind of nice. It, it really works well with uh, my packaging concept, Go style packages, where um, the different files are essentially out of order composable because of the declaration order, both within the files and between the files, doesn't matter. And so order independent declarations really enables a bunch of nice workflows. And uh, it's one thing that uh, I think is maybe a little bit interesting in the compiler if you've never seen something like this before. So uh, I haven't implemented it. I, I don't know for sure if this will work, but I have a pretty good idea of a simple design that I think should uh, should be nice and simple and will do the job. And so my idea is basically, um, you know, so let me let me write some example uh, let me write some example declarations uh, and and what you might uh, expect to happen here. Uh, one, one example is, um, you, you know, you could just do something, or not, not like that, but you could do, you could do something like this, where you have two constants, uh, one is referring to the other, this is totally valid, and, you know, it, it, in a language that uh, does not have order independent uh, declarations, this would be the same as this, right? It, it just has to infer this ordering. And if you're generating the corresponding C code, uh, that's essentially what it would do. I mean, depending on uh, whether how we end up generating constants in C, but you would end up, you you know, let's say it's a st static const uh, int b, and and it would end up generating uh, this order even if the original uh, order was something like this. Uh, so that's one case. It has to deal with with say, constant dependencies. Uh, another one is uh, structs. So if you have one struct A and it has a, uh, or let's call it uh, S, uh, and it has a, a field T, and um, and this is a by value field, it's not a pointer field. Well, actually, let let me mention that first, I guess. If you um, if you have a pointer field uh, to a type that's like for kind of for declared, um, then on the on on this on the C side, like once you eventually order things. 
uh, we don't need to actually reorder the declarations. We can just forward declare. So we just have to uh, do something like like this on the uh, on the C side. Um, but if you have, let me just insert some separators, make it clear. These are separate cases. Um, but if, on the other hand, you actually have a value field rather than a pointer field, um, then um, you actually do have to reorder things. This is hurting my brain to move quickly back and forth between the order declarations, uh, as well as the other one, uh, TT, something like this. Um, and I guess notably, if, um, if, if instead you have something like this, where they're actually mutually referential, but only via string pointers, um, then the distinction is actually really important. It's not just a matter of, oh, do I think it's nicer to have a for declaration versus actually reordering uh, the declarations uh, relative to the source file order? But you know, when you have this kind of case, it's actually a very meaningful difference because, um, you know, th this is. Oh, and I, I would have to type def them, which I'm not doing. So for, sorry about that. Um, but uh, so, so what was that? Uh, st. Uh, you know, you can do this and this, and that's legal. Uh, it wouldn't, there's no way to reorder them so that you don't need a fort declaration. Um, whereas if you take the same case, but you now make the fields value fields rather than pointer fields, um, this is, you know, illegal cyclic value dependency, basically. So, just some cases to think about to start out um, about what order independent declarations mean and what it implies. And you can think of it in terms of, you know, the C code and what's legal in C, if that helps you, but also it just semantically, like if you think of what this would have to be, uh, it would have to be some sort of infinite value type, right? Because like, you, you, I think you can see it. If, if you imagined how it would be laid out, it would sort of just recur infinitely. It would never have a termination. So that, that's ultimately uh, why this is illegal uh, when you have value semantics. And so um, that, that, that's one case. There's also interesting cases where the constant expression stuff from before uh, intercedes in the, in the more type oriented stuff. So for example, if I have, uh, if I have a type and uh, I have a, uh, let's say I have an int array and uh, this depends on, uh, on t through size of t, this might seem a little bit weird to you, and certainly it's not a super common case, but stuff like this does definitely happen. Um, sometimes you want to compute array sizes based on uh, size of calculations, and uh, this introduces uh, order dependencies, especially from the C perspective, right? Like if you wanted to um, generate C code from this, you would have to reorder the, this is basically like a value dependency, even though there's not a value loop in between the fields because of this uh, size of uh, in, in the array bounds. So this would have to be, uh, or let me, so let's say that would be int i, and this would be int a size of t, something like this. Um, so that's another case to think about is that, um, you know, the, the constant expression evaluation uh, forces dependencies. So it seems like there's a lot of different cases and you can imagine that if you took a very ad hoc um, kind of case analysis approach to this general problem, it could get really, really crazy and, and you know, error prone and a ton of code, um, maybe very hard to extend after the fact if you wanted to change something. Um, so what's a, what's a good uh, algorithm in my opinion? Um, well, the one I have in mind is, uh, let's see, the one I have in mind is um, memorization style dependency directed uh, recursion. So what this means is, l l let, me, let me pretend I'm a, a compiler and I'm just sort of looking at these declarations. Um, start with set of declarations. 
Um, initially, um, you have a simple table from names to entities. An entity has a, a state which can either be unresolved, resolving, or resolved. Um, a kind, and this could be, this is sort of a semantic, I guess, um, well, let's say it's associated with a declaration, first of all, uh, syntactic. So, um, you know, the idea is that, uh, w sorry, just to back up, once you've done the AST parse, you have a bunch of these top level, um, uh, top level declarations, decals as they're called in the code, each of which has a name. And so step one is just to make a symbol table and that symbol table uh, maps from the names to entities and entities initially are essentially just all they really contain of useful data is the pointer to the declaration that's associated with the name. So in this case, you know, S would be associated with this declaration, T would be associated with this declaration, but it would just be an AST pointer. There wouldn't really be any deeper meaning to it at that point. Um, um, And then the resolution algorithm goes as follows. Um, you go through the declarations in order, um, vi visit each um, declaration in order, or each entity in order, let's say. Um, but, but you know, you visit them in source order because the order in which you visit them will actually affect code generation because uh, the C code will order things partially based on the source order. Uh, so it is actually important for code quality on the C side, what order you use. But in terms of getting correct results, like does something type check or is something valid, it actually doesn't matter which order you visit things in. And so you visit things in order and um, then you basically um, uh, do, for each entity, for an entity, if unresolved, set state to resolving and start resolving recursively. If resolved, return pointer to re resolve data. Um, if resolving, we have a loop, um, print error, and exit or just, I guess, print error, uh, report error. So the idea here is, um, let's take this case. Let's take this case here, for example. Um, so suppose this, these are the declarations we have. First, we make a simple table and it maps from, um, it maps like this. And we have one from T to to this. <clears throat> and uh, so that's what we start out with. And then we just start walking through things in order. And then we say, okay, let's first start resolving S because that S is the first thing in the declaration order. And what we basically do is we say, okay, S is a struct and uh, it, you know, we have the declaration. We go walk the, the fields of the, uh, of the aggregate declaration. We see there's an A field. And then we say, okay, we have to resolve its type and that's just a recursive, that's a recursive descent of the type declaration, which is in this case, it's an array uh, of base type int with a size of size of t. Size of t is a constant expression. And, and that constant expression is represented as an expr, right? That's a syntactic AST node. Um, and so we start resolving things. And so for example, first we resolve the base type and the base type just gets resolved because it's a base type. So that returns um, a pointer to the, to the type definition that corresponds to that base type. And then we parse, then we resolve the right-hand side constant expression. And, um, and this has to be an integer because we're using it in a array bounds context. And so in, as part of resolving it, we're basically going to be doing a couple of things. We're going to be resolving names. And so for example, to compute the constant value of size of T, we have to resolve the, the name of T. Uh, we also have to type check so, you know, if you're adding a float to an int that doesn't type check, uh, and so we have to do that. And we also have to actually do constant expression evaluation. So, you know, if this is one plus size of T, 
uh, it's not enough to just resolve the size of t sub expression. We also have to type check it that uh, it's an integer so that it matches the one, and we have to actually uh, you know compute the value of one plus the size of, and so on. Uh, so, th so that's basically what we do is we do this recursive resolution of, of declarations, which descends into resolving the fields, which descends into resolving the types, which descends into resolving type names, which resolves into, in the case of array types, resolving um, constant expressions, which in turn can resolve to names. So as, as, as we recursively visit this stuff, eventually we're going to want to resolve this name T. And at this point, since we're visiting things in source order, T hasn't been resolved to anything. And so we will recursively resolve it. You can imagine at some point uh, inside this whole thing, we will say resolve re resolve name uh, t basically, uh, and this will re return something. Um, and this will recursively, you know, this would basically, I mean, you can kind of imagine that like in pseudocode form, um, the resolve name t would be like okay, th there's a something like this, and you get an entity back. I guess it's probably a pointer, uh, and you know you would say something like, um, you know, there would be an entry where you say sim get. You look up in the symbol table, um, and you say, you know, if if if, if there isn't an entry in the symbol table, um, then you'd say no name, uh, no declaration, or no no name correspond, no name called, whatever. Um, and um, and otherwise, you would uh, basically say something like, um, if int state is int entity resolving, um, then you'd say maybe recursive. Uh, cyclic dependency. Um, otherwise, um, well, actually, let's see here. If int state is resolved, then I think you just return it. Otherwise, if it's in the middle of resolving, it means that we were already, as part of resolving that entity, we ended up looping back to itself somehow, either directly or indirectly through other types or other declarations. And so that represents an error. Um, uh, and finally, in this case, you know, there's only one possibility, and that's this thing is unresolved. Then we have to set the state field, uh, and I guess yeah, we're not. We have implicit uh, pointer to stuff for fields, and state then becomes uh, resolving, and then um, you know, you can try like resolve decal and. Uh, and decal or something like that. And maybe you do this, something like that. Or maybe that you do it, maybe you do it like this. Just to make it more like a memorization style algorithm. Um, where, you know, essentially the expected path is once something has been resolved, it just falls through to here and you just return it directly. So it's only in the case where it's actually unresolved that you have to do something special. So the idea, the whole idea behind this uh, thing is, is an idea called memorization. And the idea is the first time you try to compute, you try to resolve something, it, it will actually have to do some work. Um, and, in, in the, and in the process of resolving it, it may have to recursively resolve other things. But then once it's been resolved, if you try to resolve it again, it just essentially has cached the result and it can just return the result immediately without trying to re-resolve it. Um, and the nice thing about this is when you're trying to do all this uh, other code for resolving types and constant expressions and so on, you can just call a function like resolve name and you don't have to worry about how it does its job. You just know that you get back a result. Um, once it's done somehow recursively. Um, so that's kind of roughly, you can see I'm actually thinking through this as I'm explaining it. I haven't worked out the details yet, but I, I've worked on similar problems before. A lot of this is, by the way, kind of like a spreadsheet um, in the sense that, you know, like you have this dependency graph 
and um, you're trying to evaluate things, uh, walking the dependency structure and sort of recursing down to figure out the dependencies and then combining the results on the way up. And in the process, you have to detect cycles and uh, to prevent infinite loops and so on. Um, and so that's the basic idea. And so if you think about what we need to get started on this, uh, we need a symbol table, which uh, for now we can just make it a linear list. Um, I should cover a hash table soon because then we can both improve the string interning and also the symbol table. And because we're using interned names, um, the table doesn't have to do any string comparisons. It can just do pointer comparisons. So it's going to be um, pretty simple, but still a linear stretchy buff type list for now. And, uh, and then I think we just have to basically kind of walk through all of these cases, um, you know, for different types of syntactic things like declarations, uh, you know, uh, expressions, uh, and so on. Uh, and just, I think, kind of work through the cases one by one. And uh, certainly some cases will be more complex than others, but I think the overall structure is going to work out pretty well. Um, so maybe let's uh, open some real code and uh, what's the shortcut? I can never remember, right. Um, let's call this uh, resolve. And I'm just gonna put everything in a C file for now. Let's make sure, I should set up the Visual Studio product to auto exclude new files. Um, but yeah, and then put it in main. it's included all right um, so let's see what do we need uh, we need let's do the symbol table just to get started um, so the symbol table let's see the symbol table um, I guess it's just going to be an array for now a stretchy buff of, uh, let's just call them symbols maybe, be self-explanatory. Um, so a symbol, maybe, yeah, maybe entities is not the right word. Maybe symbols is the right word, so let's just use that. So uh, it has a name, which is interned, um, and then we need some sort of kind, I guess, or well, at least a state, let's say. Um, and so this would be, for example, the cases we covered before. Um, something like that, and we will just add more later here. And definitely, well, we definitely need a declaration, so let's add that. Uh, and then we have the sim table, and this is called sim list. Uh, and then we want a function. Uh, definitely the most basic is just sim get, where you give it a name and it just does a search. Um, because it's interned, we can just do a direct comparison like this. Um, and if we don't find anything, then we return null. And then you also want to be able to put a symbol there. And it's always going to start out as unresolved. And so I think you just, for now, at least with the data we have, I think you just want to put this. And so that would be uh, buff push, some list, um, name, sim, unresolved, decal, something like this. And I guess you would do, do I need to return the value? I guess I really don't. I mean, it'd be easy to do so, but no reason to do it because then we have to test that, we, that it works. Uh, so let's just stub in a uh, simple test case here. Um,
So if we do this, we should get that. And then if we put in a declaration, um, this is, this is, so I'm trying to remember. Actually, we don't even have to do this. Just make sure, because otherwise things are probably going to go badly. Um, so it has a name. I guess tech. I, I could just do the comparison on the decal field. It's one extra indirection, but once we do that, nah, I don't want to do that. Once we do the hash table, we'll probably, I don't know. It's a little bit redundant, but feels more correct even if it's also inside the decal itself. So yeah, we specify foo and then um, we, I'm trying to remember decal const, I guess we can just say expert int 42, something like that. And then we put the symbol, um, just do it like this. Uh, def decal def differs in level of indirection from int. Oh. Um, we should put this. Don't want to look at that output for now. Actually, um, let me make sure we don't put duplicate entries as well. Kind of assumes it's item potent. But actually, let's just do that first. It's the annoying thing about not. Um, oh. Let's see here. Some get foo. Okay, so we get null. Mm. Where they're doing something stupid. So this is the initial. This is the second. So it still hasn't been. Oh, that's the debug check. I see. Oh, I have to enter in my my strings. That's why. Of course. Not. I don't know that. I would expect that to work, but maybe in debug it doesn't. Okay, so that definitely was the issue. Um, okay, and then something like this. Okay. 
<clears throat> and then let's see. So let's say we have a top level function called resolve symbols. And that's just going to walk through the list. and resolve each of them in turn. Because it's convenient to have something just called resolve name, which is basically like this. Um, actually, I think one problem with using a flat array is that this, depending on whether we want to hang on to symbol pointers, we probably shouldn't. Yeah. The thing I was thinking is that the symbol pointers will become invalidated when the list grows, um, but uh, I don't think it should be an issue, but it's maybe something to watch out for. All right. Um, so then to resolve the symbol, I think essentially what you do is you say something similar to what we wrote here. Um, Let's do some stupid error messages for now. Um, what did I call that function? I thought I called it fatal error, or just fatal, I guess. All right. Um, all right, so you do this, and then if you can resolve it to a symbol, you go resolve it, and then you return what will now have been a resolved thing. Uh, and this is the actual workhorse. Uh, I assume this is going to basically, um, you know, it's going to say only if this thing is unresolved, does it actually do anything? Or, or maybe let me phrase it like an early out. So this thing just returns if it's already resolved. Um, and then otherwise, if it's in the process of resolving, it means we have some kind of cyclic thing. Um, uh, otherwise, we're left with the general case. And that's where you go and resolve the declaration, I think. So what should that resolve to? Let's see. If you have a constant, it should resolve to a type and a constant value. Um, to return a value, I guess. Let me just try to think of it as a case analysis. Um, for example, if you have a con, or what am I writing? It's nonsense. Um, so if you have a const, for example, you want to resolve the right-hand side Speckle. 
resolved, um, resolve constant expression. This is going to be, I don't know, const val, const entity, maybe. And uh, hmm, we need to have some way of checking types. Oh, that's not true here. It could be anything at this point. Um, so what do we have to do after that? It's a constant expression. I think that's probably it. But then it has to somehow be associated with that symbol. Um, so maybe that's where we go and do this. So type is going to be not like a type spec in a syntactic sense, but an actual semantic type. Um, I think for now we can just, do I want to make it a pointer? Maybe I have to do has consing for types to make it easy to do comparisons. Um, so rather than thinking of what I want them to be inside, maybe uh, I should just think of it in terms of a set of constructor functions like, um, like there's a notion of a primitive type. Uh, for now, let's just say there's ints and floats. And there are um, something like this. So let's just say we have two types. We have integers and floats. Um, and then we can construct, uh, we can construct more compound types using this. And you can see if you compare it to what we did for the, for the type specs, hopefully the difference is, is, in, is evident. There's some stuff that's similar. I guess we have to do funks, but let's ignore that for now. But you know, for example, for names, the whole notion of a name type doesn't really exist at this level. You can construct some primitive types that are built in, and then you can construct. I guess I have to do the same for um, for struct as well. So let's see. Um, a struct type has what? It has a bunch of fields. Each of them for now, let's just say it has a name and a type. Um, and the same for union. I guess we just filled the one in from func as well. So a func, had, a function type has what? Uh, a bunch of func parameters. Maybe do we want to use the, uh, we need something equivalent, but semantic. Um, so this is a 
Click Punk Ram. Because actually we can use the same thing. Click Field, uh, Params, NumParams, and Return Type. So we can use this to construct pointers, arrays, structs, unions, and funks. And then what does that mean in terms of what we need here? Well, we need some, some different kinds corresponding to those cases. Ints and floats or just don't need auxiliary data, but if you're a, uh, a pointer thing, then you need, um, you need a base. This is true, I guess, in both cases. Um, maybe I'll write it like this for now. It's kind of implied that everything there is a type, so let's just call it ret. Um, so that covers pointers, arrays, structs, and oh, this is func. Uh, aggregate. And here's the question of some of these, it seems like they should definitely hash cons, probably not the structs because th these have identity. If different structs are not the same, they, just because they happen to have the same fields and names and stuff like that. But um, for this stuff here, I think you want to do hash consing. So uh, let's say type alloc. Let's just use a normal x malloc type thing for now. Um, maybe x malloc. So let's zero it out. And for these, uh, there's actually nothing else to it. Because they are fully uh, fully defined by, no, that's actually not true. I think for for these you actually want to have not functions at all. Um, it's something like this. Okay, let's not do hash consing for now. We'll just do structural comparison. No, hash consing is nice. Let's do hash consing. Um, 
it's due to the stretchy buffers. So as it corner types, um, so let's, what should this thing be called? It's an array of things where the key is the base type and the um, and the value is the corresponding corner type. We're just this is again going to be a hash table eventually, but um, for now we just do it the slow way with the linear walks. And then if we find an existing match, we just uh, return that. Otherwise, we have to um, we have to allocate a new type. So the corner. Um, Um, and the base type is going to be the thing we filled in here. We're going to return it, but before returning it, we put it on the cache list. Um, Make this empty for now since we're not testing that stuff. Okay. Um, It's going to be the same, the same shit.
this obscure the indentation. Why is it? Why is it indenting it weird? Same deal again, cached array types, uh, base size T. All right, we should test that this works before proceeding. Okay, um, so, so how do we test it? Well, basically you want to say, Something like this, uh, int pointer, um, something like this. Let's first test this actually does something. So first up, we have a base type, which is the int. And then we have an empty list of cached things. So it should just step right over, allocates it, builds in the field puts it on the cache list, and now it's in there. And um, basically you want to verify that if you look it up again, you get the same thing that you just put in, so it's idempotent. And that works. Um, and you want to do the same thing for array types. Let's say it's a float, it's a float of four ints. Let's call it float four array. And you want to verify again. Uh, well, let's do a few obvious things, I guess. Let's verify well, uh, type float for this should first off be equal to this. Same as with our pointer case. Um, but you know, if you do it with three, for example, let's just do a negative test. We, we want to make sure that. They don't match. Uh, well, let's first check that they do match. Okay. Um, and then we should do something similar here. Right now, there's a, there's two two. Well, there there's these. Uh, um, Um, and you can also do maybe more interesting stuff like like this. So that all works. So sorry, I, I should explain more about the idea because I keep saying hash consing. Um, this is a really important concept, uh, very simple, fortunately, and you've already seen it for interning. So I'll just explain it, but I just want to bang it out. Um, we still have plenty of time. So uh, what was I doing? Um, let me back way up. <clears throat> so so the idea behind what I was doing is that we need a way to construct um, some sort of representations of types in the type system that will also be used, you know, by the the code generating backends and so on. And um, I would say there's roughly two ways you could approach this. Um, one of them is every time you're constructing a type with a function like type putter, it actually generates even provided with the same arguments. It um, even provided with the same arguments, uh, it will generate new results. So there, you know, because it's pointer based, it will allocate a new structure in memory and fill in the fields like it should, but there will be different results for different invocations, even with the same arguments, uh, which, you know, normally would not be a problem. But uh, one thing that 
uh, introduces is the fact that in order to check for whether two types are the same, you now have to do sort of a recursive comparison of all the fields, like, you know, or, or like if it's two pointer types, for example, you have to compare, you know, they're both pointers and their, their base things compare equal, which is now not just a pointer comparison check, but a structural value comparison check. Um, but by instead doing it like I'm doing, where basically you always get the same result given the same values for at least some of these type constructors. We basically have something that's a nearly perfect uh, mirror of stir intern. So you'll remember, it's not the one I want to look at. It's common.c, right? Um, you know, in stir intern, we have the same idea where we take a, a value, we intern it, and then we expect for the same value to always get the same result back, which is the canonical representative of that value. And here we're doing sort of the same thing for types. And it means that in everywhere else, we can easily just do pointer comparisons to check for exact equality. Now, the case where that won't be true is for structs, because when you're constructing a structure type, for example, um, you know, it's not just enough to have the same structure, there's actually identity. So even with hash consing, it wouldn't really do the right thing. Uh, if you call type, uh, type struct uh, two different times with the same fields, they're going to be different instances that ha happen to have the same internal structure. And in, in theory, you could map between them and there wouldn't be any uh, structural mismatch. But in C and C style languages, you'd have what's you're normally called nominal typing, where different things that are structurally identical, at least if they are um, you know, structs and unions and stuff like that, they're actually different. Like they're not, you can't assign one to the other without mem copying or something like that. Um, so that's why this will actually be a different, um, this will actually not do this kind of caching we're doing. But if you look at the caching and the way it works, it's very much like our string interning. We're even using a list of, whereas we will be using a, a hash table almost certainly uh, eventually. But, you know, basically, you basically make sure uh, by, by checking the cache first that you never create a new instance of something if we already have a match for it in the cache. And so we check for a cache hit, and if there is one, we just return the cached result. Otherwise, we create a new instance and put it in the cache so that now every subsequent access will, will hit the cache rather than creating a new instance. Um, and by doing these pointer checks down here, we were basically just verifying that the behavior was as expected. Um, so yeah, you can see in order to do the type resolving, we're going to have to push the stack pretty hard a few times because there's a bunch of other things that are necessary, like a representation of types like this. Um, okay, let's do the same thing just to finish off. Um, let's do structs as well. And like I said, unlike the other case, structs are always going to result in a new instance. Um, Okay, so one thing I have to think about is, are the type field, is the type field struct, um, we should probably make our own copy, is what I'm thinking. Um, and we can potentially change this later, but, um, so what was it? Uh, aggregate fields. Just do the same here, but with a different uh, tag. I'll just eyeball this though before um, this many fields, each of this size, and then copy it over. All right. This is not going to be too different either, actually. Although for the function types, actually, we do want to do interning. So that's an interesting case. Um, maybe I'll move this up so that all the interning stuff is up here. 
right? So for function types, we do want to do interning because two function types with the same set of parameters and the same return value is the same type. Um, so this will be a little bit different in that sense. Um, So, right, we have to put, um, So this is going to be, I guess, a little bit more different um, because Okay, let's see here. If and we have to do a, a so, so we first have to check the sizes match. So let's check the easy fixed length stuff. Uh, if uh, numparams equals numparams and ret equals ret, then uh, we can do it. Actually, let's do it this way. It's way easier. We don't have to do all the parallel pointer stepping. Um, so if um, let's see, if uh, if it params i equals or not equals because then we have a mismatch. Um, Uh, and, but if we go through all the way, then we have a match. Oh, let's see here. So, Hmm. Let me think. I, I'm, I'm starting to see like this stuff wouldn't be necessary. If the param struct itself was an, an entity on its own. Um, rather than just a value type thing. So maybe that's what we do.
maybe we just leave it like this for now. Um, let's just leave it like this for now. The thing that's annoying is we have to allocate um, This is pretty similar to this stuff. So bullets, grams, Let me just read this code from top because this was much more complicated than the other sharks. Iterate over the cached function types. Uh, first, verify that the parameter not counts and the return type matches. In that case, we go over each of the parameters and we verify that. Wait, wait, wait. We don't need name match. So actually, the, the, it shouldn't be using type field at all should just be using like this. Um, Up there. Okay, let's read it now. Simpler and correct for once, hopefully. Um, go through these, make sure those fixed parts match. And incidentally, now that we know they have the same length, we don't have to worry about one being longer or shorter than the other and, and overstepping the bounds for this index. Um, and this is clearly the wrong sense. So if any of them mismatch, then we have a mismatch. Um, we can also get a mismatch by failing this check here. No, that's not right. The mismatch should be here. Um, it can't be... No, actually, it should just be a break. Because if we... No, if we break out of this loop, we will return. So that's definitely not right. Um, so if we fail this loop, we just want to go here, basically, to say next. <clears throat> Fortunately, you can't do this in suit, which is a little bit annoying. By the way, this is why we may end up adding labeled breaks and continues, just because this is a really common pain in the ass. And I mean, I don't have anything against using go-tos, but um, you actually don't need general purpose unstructured go-tos for this kind of use case. This is a very standard thing you run into and it's so annoying. You can of course handle it very ugly by having uh, some sort of field that says I, I had a match or I didn't have a match, but then all the outer loops have to check that flag and, and it gets nasty. So anyway, let's just leave it like that. Uh, how, how are we doing on time? I think I'm going to stop for Q&A um, after verifying that this function at least doesn't crash. Um, So let's say we have int int func, by which I mean um, let's say just a single variable, um, so a type 
int and a type int is return value. And it matches, allocate this, fill it in with Sprite. because the stuff I'm most uncertain about is the parameter matching. And actually, let's do it like this. Um, Yeah, that works. Um, so yeah, we, we didn't, uh, we started on declaration resolution, but uh, I wouldn't say we even got sidetracked. This is actually something that I knew we had to do. And so I just started it. Um, I may change how we do things after the stream when I'm not just typing as fast as possible and, and have a chance to think about it, or maybe based on observations in the Q&A, but um, we at least started on this stuff and um, I'm going to look at Q&A now and try to answer questions. But uh, this, you, you, please don't file bugs for this code because this is a very draft zero level material and I'm probably gonna change it after the stream when I have a chance to think about it at a more leisurely pace. But uh, anyway, got started and I'll spend the rest of the day trying to think about whether this is the right way to do it and hopefully get, uh, you know, refine the design and then make some progress and then next stream, uh, Actually, I'll be working over the weekend as well, so I expect this stuff to be quite far along, if not completely done on Monday. Um, but at least you saw me sort of make the first uh, shovel, whatever you call it, uh, thing for for a new house. So anyway, I'm going to do Q and A now. Uh, fire away with any questions. All right. So yeah, at me with questions. Um, Someone's saying, could you use a unique string interned as the cache key? You have the type name, so for pointers, a key could be foo star, et cetera. Um, no, I don't think you can because you want to be able to type def stuff. Like the superficial aspects of a type are not relevant for type equality, uh, right? Like our, our type defs are basically like Cs. So, uh, names resolve to things and those things can then is what you intern based on in order to get this kind of structural equality via pointer equality. Um, yeah, and someone's saying the English idiom I was looking for was breaking ground, yeah, with a shovel, that's right. Um, someone's asking, is Ion going to have anything like type qualifiers and if so, how would this work with the canonical version of primitive types? When you say type qualifiers, I, I assume you mean const and volatile. Um, yes, I guess we will. Um, I just decided to punt on some of that stuff because it's just one more case to handle and I don't think it's going to uproot the entire schema. Um, so I, we, we will, but for now I'm intentionally deferring that uh, until the other stuff is working. Oh, and someone's saying they're ready for more homework. Uh, I'll think of something. I don't have anything planned for today, but uh, I mean, I can come up with something on the spot. Um, I would say that, so I saw a few people who started doing their own parallel implementation of some of the stuff I did last week with uh, the parser and AST builder and stuff. So if you wanted just, if you wanted to write some code, I would, you know, that, that would be a good big project is 
and I would suggest that in general, if someone wants to not just follow along with the code and experiment with it in place, but maybe build their own parallel implementation, maybe try different implementation choices if you feel experimental or you just disagree with how I'm doing things, that's definitely a, a big time sink, uh, something you can learn a lot from, I'm sure, by doing that in parallel and kind of, in some cases, maybe racing ahead of me and waiting to see if I do things differently. In other cases, maybe waiting for me to do something and reacting to it and doing it either the same or a different way. But uh, that would be an open-ended kind of thing you could do if you just want stuff to do. But um, I'll think of more homework type stuff. I was also thinking one fun thing to do would be to assign optional, not assign, that's the wrong word. I like just have random, like each, each stream just have like a cool article or a cool video presentation that I can link to and um, you know, that, that has some sort of topical relevance or maybe an indirect relevance to the general area we're covering. And so that way people have, if they just want to spend more time doing stuff related to the project, that would be another way to do it. And I have, you know, a, a big backlog of and, and stash of stuff like that, that I could just include when I think it's topical. Um, if, if people want to dedicate even more time to this. All right, let me see if there's any questions. I think people caught bugs as I was making them, but I think I fixed the worst of them myself. Um, someone saying, do I need do you need to distinguish function types based on whether they reference static variables? Static variables, do you mean function statics? Um, we're not going to have like, if you mean like nested functions, like Algol style or, you know, nested functions, we, we're not going to have nested functions in that style. We're, we're going to have nested functions in a way of just namespacing, but that doesn't have any access to statics or anything else like that. In fact, I think we may not have function statics at all because, I don't know, it just seems like occasionally necessary or occasionally useful, but not that useful. And we will have other namespacing mechanisms for people who want that. Um, but I haven't thought too much actually about function statics. But uh, no, at least in the context of your question, I don't think we need to distinguish those function types. Um, and someone's saying, this is basically the, the hash consync thing for the type constructors. This is basically just like string interning. That's absolutely true. So in terms of homework, if you want to broaden your horizons, uh, Google on Wikipedia uh, for hash consync. This is the idea. It goes back to the 60s in Lisp. You can see they mentioned the connection to string interning. They even mentioned the flyweight pattern, which is heresy. I don't know if I would call that hash consync, but maybe it is. And I, my brain has just forgotten what it once knew about design patterns. But um, yeah, hash consync, really cool idea. You can see there's other stuff here. If you want to see how cool this technique is, um, Google for it, look into stuff. A lot of it is going to be from the Lisp world and the functional programming world. No, maybe not functional programming because it's kind of a non-functional technique. It requires a global, semi-global uh, mutable state under the covers. But it, it, it provides a kind of functional like facade in the sense that you know it behaves idempotently. So even though it doesn't return the same value every time you call it, it returns, after the first time, it always returns the same thing. So it's idempotent, which is, in a functional programming context is almost as good as referential integrity. Um, and so it is actually useful even in purely functional languages sometimes to have this stuff because uh, even if the implementation on the inside is mut mutation based from the outside, it's, it behaves a lot like a normal referentially transparent function. Um, but, you, but your language would need pointer equality to really exploit it. But you know, there's languages like ML and certainly scheme and stuff where uh, you, you have pointer equality, not just uh, structural equality because they're, they have some kind of escape hatch for a uh, mutable state. All right, let's see what else people are asking. Uh, why do we use that double pointer? I assume you mean for my array of pointers, right? Right, so um, for, for params, for example, each of the params is itself a pointer to a type uh, and then this is, you know, this is the standard idiom for a dynamically allocated array of something where you, you represent it by a pointer to the first element. And since the first element itself has type, pointer to type, it ends up being a double pointer. So this is a pretty standard idiom when you have arrays of pointer types. Um, Someone's asking, how is my melee? 
given that I live in Thailand and even my Thai is atrocious, uh, my melee is non-existent. Any technical questions? Um, all right. Do going to do a scroll back to see if I missed anything else. Um, why is sim unresolved a no op? Shouldn't that be? Yeah, that stuff is probably. Oh, you're right. That was a typo. Thank you kindly. Let's see, I'm still doing scroll back. If there's not a lot of questions, I'll just finish, and you know, people can always always ask on on the Bitwise forums, the Handmade Network, uh, Discord. Um, I'm usually around for at least. Most, I mean, most of my day hours, which is basically from now on, and plus plus 12 hours or something like that, at least. Uh, not necessarily always able to respond immediately, but usually catch up on questions pretty quickly when I when I get back to the computer or switch away from coding. Um, all right, it's a bunch of discussion from, from way back early, but Oh, okay. So InsoBot is here. Let me just mod in. <sighs> Yay. Um, would it be possible to have a primitive type that is similar to exceptions in O languages so that try catch clauses are possible? I'm not sure I really understand. Oh, I see. You mean something like the maybe monad. Um, is there a good Wikipedia page? The Wikipedia page, I'm sure, is as terrifying as it is for, for most things with a theoretical. So yeah, I mean, like the overall design goal for Ion is to be basically only really fixing C in areas where um, there's implementation difficulties in the compiler, and then a few areas where I feel strongly, like the declaration order stuff, um, to actually change the language a little bit, but not really add new semantic constructs per se. And so uh, stuff like the maybe monad um, and having language level support like do notation and Haskell, I mean, it's a great idea. Um, Certainly compared, if you look at a lot of Go code, the way they do manual error handling, having multiple return values helps Go a little bit with that. And the fact that the colon equals operator in Go can reassign existing variables and shadow them makes it nice. You can have the OK flag that kind of has a pretty consistent uh, visual pattern in your code, but you still have to constantly check it. If you have something like the maybe monad with a little bit of language support like Haskell do notation, do they have do notation here? Yeah, they do here. Um, you can write this stuff pretty easily and, and um, cleanly, but that's the kind of thing that's very much out of scope for um, for Ion because it is it's not it's, it 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 knows its place. It's not trying to uh, fix everything with C. It, it takes a very sort of uh, very minimalistic approach to making changes to C. That really, since this is a Bitwise is about implementing stuff ourselves, we want to make our own our job easier, but we don't really try to. Uh, implement you know the best language ever or to solve all these real problems i mean i do think clean ways of doing error handling are real issues um like in c for example the practical effect of the fact that error handling is c is sort of awkward um is that most people don't really do it so either they have some sort of global bailout you know fatal errors where they could easily recover if they just had cleaner ways of writing the code because when you start having to do fine-grained error handling in c um, it turns into a giant mess, and sometimes you do need fine-grained error handling. Like ideally, you don't, but sometimes you do, and and see that really turns into instead of very clean one line after the other, you now have one line a bunch of stuff, one line a bunch of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I mean the answer is I'm not trying to solve that, but it's a real problem, and other languages have pretty good solutions. I think the Mona, the maybe approach, which you know other languages, I think even C++ has stood optional now. And like everything else in C++, um, you know, 
it's like a, I'm sure a massive foot gun, but at least there's no general notion of optional values with some clean way of composing them maybe. Um, so you don't have to constantly do ifs after every single call that maybe return an optional value. Uh, that sort of idea is uh, very helpful, but um, yeah, we're not gonna do anything like that. But a bunch of other languages are doing interesting stuff in that area. Um, exceptions I think are actually pretty good, uh, just not in a value semantics language. Um, and even in C, actually, there are certain kinds of error handling that are done very, I was talking on the Discord about this yesterday. Even in C, if there's a way to do exception style non-local exits using um, set jump, which registers a, a point in the stack context and long jump, which actually jumps and reinstates that uh, context. Um, this doesn't, if, if you do very coarse grained resource management, like you have arena based memory management and you have a global list in a, a context struct somewhere that keeps track of all open files, for example, then doing non local exit uh, exception style error handling um, with set jump and long jump is actually a really good technique. So it works for that. Um, but you don't want to use that for fine grained error handling. That's really just you're doing a huge, for example, recursive thing, and then you want to bail out from some deep nested place where something went very wrong and you want to jump out you don't want to do exit to the os because that's nasty you just want to jump up to the top level entry function in the api and then maybe clean some stuff up and the cleanup is very easy to do at the top level like i said because all your memory is managed by a few arenas that are sort of globally registered rather than each little call on the stack frame doing some local allocation that it then has to manually clean up with with free on the way out but if you structure things so that uh, you don't have fine-grained sort of stack-oriented resource ownership, in other words, you don't do it like C++, not even close, then exception handling is actually really good, even in systems languages. Um, but you do have to do it more coarse-grained, and you have to understand the trade-offs. But uh, that style is actually really good in C as well. You just have to know how to structure the rest of your system around it. All right. Um, All right, so it looks like we're kind of coming to the end. Uh, if no one else has any other questions, that was a big digression, just a little bit of my, my thoughts in general on error handling, but we, yeah, we're not doing anything really new. We're just doing the same thing C are doing, which is nothing, but um, you know, I think good error handling ultimately is less, like while language level stuff really helps with fine-grained error handling, at a meta level, you want to structure your APIs and systems so that you you minimize the need for error handling. Um, an example of that, let, let me give an example. Uh, like this is a digression, but I think it's actually something that people who design APIs don't don't do a very good job at in general. But I'll mention an example of something that does do a good job, uh, pretty pretty good job. Um, there's a class of APIs that are mostly uh, push oriented. In other words, I'm not asking the API for results. I am, for example, appending to a command buffer, um, like in direct 3D. Nowadays, you don't have to handle, most people maybe don't know enough about direct 3D to understand this explanation, but in the old days, when you lost a device, you had to sort of at the top level of your frame loop, you had to kind of recreate the device and so on. Nowadays, uh, starting with D3D10, it was much easier you don't have to really do much in the vein of that you really only have to handle resolution changes and recreate any associated resources like render targets but most stuff just keeps working even with lost even in cases that would normally result in dev lost devices back in the d3d9 days but even d3d9 because a graphics api is mostly you telling the gpu what to do you're saying okay set the state uh, draw these triangles um, and so on uh, almost all of the, a the API calls in your renderer are not going to expect meaningful values back from the API upon which the rest of your control flow is contingent. You're just going to fire stuff off. And as a result, um, the semantics of a lot of these APIs can be made such that even if there's an error, um, they can signal it locally. So you can get a return error value, but you don't have to respond to it because the, the semantics of calling the function with these sort of push-oriented APIs when, when, when it's in an error state is simply to throw away your request. Like it's just ignoring the request. Um, and the nice thing about that is um, the way you basically implement that is 
the API state object has an error accumulator, kind of like Erano in the standard C library, but local to an API context. And then when an error happens, it basically registers that in a sticky way. So sometimes you see people call this sticky errors. And then basically all functions fail until you handle the error manually. But the nice thing about that is in, for example, a renderer, you only have to have one point in your code, which is the very top of your render loop, like when you start rendering a new frame, that actually recognizes and handles errors. And then the rest of your calls to that API can just be sort of passed through in the case where there's an error, it just gets ignored. Um, but you don't have, and, and because of the sticky error, um, it can track whether you've handled the error. Then once you actually handle the error, it clears the sticky error flag, and now you're good to go. Now things don't get ignored anymore. And there's a lot of APIs that if you segregate the APIs, this is something, I mean, this is almost a sign pattern level bullshit, but there's something called command query separation, <clears throat> which from a weird vantage point is kind of about this, but it's the idea is that if you separate your APIs into things that only issue commands uh, from things that return meaningful results, like results of queries, um, certain good things happen. But in specifically in the case I just mentioned, it means that command type APIs can just be, have kind of no op semantics when it, they're in an error state and the error handling gets way easier. Um, you do have to think through the implications for your specific API, but th there's like, a what I'm basically saying is there are certain general categories of API design uh, approaches that minimize the need for fine-grained error handling. And if you do it that way, you don't need your language to help you with that. Um, so a lot of the problems go away with just proper systems level design. But that said, some things do need fine-grained error handling and those are just a pain in the ass in C. And unfortunately, we're not gonna really try to fix that. All right. That's enough philosophical discourse. Okay, I think I'm gonna, so what is a good set of quotes today? Yeah, the problem is we didn't do, all of this code is basically scaffolding. So I, I guess I have to talk about something meaningful that's not just uh, typing code. Um, but yeah, this is the this is the kind of code that makes me feel a little bit awkward because it doesn't really do anything. It's just all preparing for something that does do something. But um, I think it's necessary. So anyway, yeah, thanks for today. I will refine this approach, think through the details, and actually write a bunch of code until next time. And maybe we will just have a system that works for this stuff by the time uh, you see me again. So uh, thanks for hanging out. I'll be around for questions on Twitch chat, on Discord, and on the forums as always. See you guys next time.